Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the Fens, basically, um, because I know about them, and because I can't be asked to talk about anything else. <laughs> you really must know. No, that's not true. Essentially, what I'm going to be talking about is how important it is, if you're an archaeologist, to get to grips with one area and really get to grips with it properly. Uh, and that's what uh, dear old Mick did in Somerset, and, 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 and that part of the world, and Bristol and all the rest of it. Um, and it's only by understanding one area in depth that you can appreciate what people in the past had to contend with. It's so easy to go skating around, and that's what we did in time. We did skate. But when we skated around to these different sites, we were always in contact with people who knew about those regions. I think I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the area I know about. We did two time teams in it. Uh, they were both uh, documentaries. Um, the first documentary the time team did at all was at Seahenge. And then, uh, I think it was a year later, we did um, uh, an episode of Flag Fen. Right. right, now let's see if this works. Tap. Ah, it does. Um, yeah, we're numbered with that light pointing at the screen now, which takes out all the contrast. Still can't be held. Um, this is the Fens, or these are the Fens. Um, it's a, in sort of old numbers, it's a million acres. I don't know what that is, divide by 2.47 to get connected. Uh, this is the edge of the fens, a million acres, Britain's largest wetland, um, and uh, this, this landscape began to flood um, as a result of North Sea levels rising um, around 3000 BC or slightly earlier in other places. And because of drainage, which wasted the peat, the peat has grown away, the landscape has now gone down to below its Bronze Age level in many places, and I think this makes it inevitable that the fens are going to have to be re-flooded probably in the next one or two centuries, because the alternative to that would be a tidal surge which hit London, and we can't have London flooded. <laughs> says he bitterly. <laughs> <laughs> right, well this is, <laughs> not very clear, um, this is Seahenge on a foggy day, it's on a sunny day, um, and this was the first time in documentary. Uh, basically it's a circle about six metres across, 55 oak posts, and at the centre there is an upside down oak tree whose roots stick above the surface. Now this should be clearer. When we came to analyse this circle, which was built incidentally between, let's get this right, April and June in the year 2049 BC. Um, when we came to analyse it carefully, we discovered that it was actually built in not phases, but episodes. So they, they use certain timbers in a deliberate way. So these are taken from certain trees and they mirror one another. And that is the face against the setting sun. There's the entrance and into the setting sun. There is the upside down tree in the middle. All the posts around the outside, which you can see being dug here under appalling conditions, um, all those posts had the bark facing outwards and the split face inwards. And the central oak tree, which you can see dominating the uh, scientist working in there, um, had all its bark carefully removed, which suggests that it was a model for a huge tree <coughs> with the bark outwards and then that the oak tree in the middle was the heart of the tree and they probably would have had a body, oh, that's better, probably would have had a body uh, nestling in among the roots. 
Um, we got a certain amount of criticism, I mean, laying aside all the, the, the fruit cakes who came and pestered us. But <laughs> some, some of the archaeologists, some of the archaeologists gave us a hard time. Um, because they said, oh, it, 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 it hasn't been properly done. I can tell you that there were 49 sections taken across there. It is the most heavily sectioned barrier that has ever been excavated. Uh, I think the detail we've got out of it has never, ever been um, uh, paralleled. We actually know the number of axes that we use. It's approximately 58. <laughs> and that tells us that there would have been a crowd of people there probably in the order of 250, something like that. Was to remove the timbers. It was all presumably done on one day, or you know, very shortly. And so what we have here is the only time in earlier prehistory in Britain where you've got evidence for a single episode of work. You can't do that in Stonehenge. Got it there. And not that side, but this side over here, we found two more circles. And because of all the fuss that had been made, English heritage said, you mustn't get those uh, timbers tree ring dated. And then my wife, who was doing the timber analysis, said to me, what would happen if one of the sea henge timbers from the new circle got muddled up with some timbers from Flagshell? <laughs> No, <laughs> couldn't do that. But it happened. <laughs> Strangest thing. And you know what? It turned out to have been felled between June and April in the year 2049 BC. So we have proof that all three sites were precisely contemporary. No, never been proved before. <coughs> But the level of detail we got was extraordinary. You, you may remember from the film, we had um, the tree being towed with a rope at the end. This is the actual rope, still in place. It's made from twisted honeysuckle. And the, some of the posts were actually shaped in situ, in the ring. And here you can see some of the wood chips with the axe facets there. These are all done with a white-bladed a uh, copper or bronze axe. Um, fantastic early evidence for timber working. Here we are making the reconstruction um, with the split oak in the foreground and uh, Bill Mick in the background. Richard Dara, our resident reconstruction expert. Um, and then here, this is a moment of proof, a rare shot of Satoni actually doing something. <laughs> <laughs> and the tree is going into the hole here. Um, it looks big, but it, it is actually about a third smaller than the Bronze Age one, but it's the only tree we could get permission to fell. Um, there's Phil doing his stuff. Um, and here we go. This is the timber wall going up. You get some idea of the scale of the thing now. Um, and we've got a pretty good estimate of the height of these trees, uh, of these posts, um, because of, of, of the way they've been split and so on. Um, uh, Mike, one of the cameramen, long-term cameramen, Mike Todd, and then of course everyone will recognize that behind. <laughs> there it is when construction is being completed. And you can see the, the sort of party taking place on the left there to celebrate it all. And it was, um, some of you outside asked me a question about the atmosphere inside the sea hinge. Um, when you go in there, you don't know there's a party going on outside. And because the tree was freshly split, there was a, 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 literally a skin stretching smell of, 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 of um, the acid given off, tannic acid given off by the oak trees. It was a very, very strange environment in there. And of course, in the past, you'd have had a body there as well. So, that was 2049 BC. Um, at about that time and slightly earlier, what was happening on the edges of the fens, so sea henges around 
to one side of the fence, but in the fence, just in. Um, this is a site I was working on in the 1970s um, at Fenge. We'll have a few, when we look at it first, these are the earliest fields still in England, uh, earliest field system. Um, all of this is about contemporary with the building of Stonehenge. And it's just that people in the east of England had better things to do with their time than like the rocks. We got on earning the, the, the bread and butter, as we still do to this day. So fields and settlements there, an open fen here, and then in the middle, an artificial platform, which is flag fen, and then an offshore island here with more fields. So, dry, wet, dry. Fengate is the name of this side of the fen, and that comes from two Viking words, meaning road to the fen. And one of the things that it irritates me intensely is now in the fens, local councils are putting up road signs, and there's a, there's a road near us called Gannigat, Warnock Gate, but pronounced road to Gannigat. And that means road to Gannock, which means an old oak tree. But the council had to simplify it and make it easier for people. And so it's called Gannigate Road. And whenever I'm in communication with the council, I insist on saying, I live quite close to Gannigate Road Road. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Now, this is a view uh, in 1974 of the open area excavations we were doing. Because we, two years previously, we realised that these straight ditches that we could see on air photos weren't, as the conventional wisdom had it, weren't Roman. Um, all straight things aren't necessarily Roman, you know. Us Brits can actually draw a straight line. All you require is two posts. Um, so, uh, and a pocket full of sand, that helps. So this is an elaborate field system laid out around 2500 BC. Um, and then in the background, you can see the basin of Flag Fen, and right on the skyline there, the brickworks of Whittlesea Brickworks, which is on the island that I was talking about that lies off the English shore. So Fengate is England, out there is Fenland, and it's never been the same. Um, so they're the brick, Whittlesea Brickworks. They're still going, um, not quite as many chimneys as they were. And bricks from the Whittlesea Brickworks were used in the White House, because they went over there as ballast in the ships. Yeah, useful fact. There we go and spend a day without learning one useful fact. Right, um, well there's a very 1970s figure there with the bushy hair. That wasn't why I put it there, it happened to be someone standing. Uh, and he's standing in a shallow Bronze Age field boundary ditch, alongside a bank which has been preserved by upcar from an 18th century drainage ditch behind him. And the reason I show this is that this would have been the bank on which a hedge was planted. And you can see the soil was disturbed um, by the roots of a, of a awful hedge plot. Now, when we found this, and I proposed it, and you can see the pre-Bronze Age soil buried in a hat underneath the upcast in the ditch. When I suggested this, we would have a, a hedge on it. It was a long laugh there, and we had found it, of course, it was yet for half. I'm delighted to say that 10 years later, Cambridge University did, not very far from here, and they came down alongside one of these ditches, and lo and behold, lots of bits of right-angled hawthorn where it had been cut as a hedge, 2500 BC. <laughs> <laughs> I love to, you know, defeating critics, even if it takes a couple of decades. <laughs> right, um, this is what, I hope it looks better from a distance, it looks crap from here. Uh, this, this is a Bronze Age grove that we have reconstructed and some Bronze Age houses which we've done at, at Flag Fen, just to get a feel for the landscape. Um, and also, because I'm a farmer, I wanted to see how these fields would actually work if you ran livestock in them. And they are extremely efficient. Those people knew what they were doing. Uh, and this isn't subsistence farming, this is large-scale sheep farming. Judging by the livestock handling systems they use, I reckon the flocks were numbered in thousands, not in the dozens that you read in textbooks. 
This is one of our houses. Eaves drip gully for the runoff from the domed roof, from the conical roof. Uh, it would have been turfed, but there's a little drain running water off the roof into a side drain into the main dike running alongside the roof. This is about 1500 BC, and frankly, um, the way it could have been laid out and everything else, it, uh, it could be medieval or even modern. Some of the ditches, Bronze Age ditches, particularly the ends of ditches, were marked by special deposits. In this case, a young woman um, in her early 20s, that's why I got a young woman in her early 20s to post next to her. Um, and I suspect that this deliberate placing of bodies at important points in the field system is a way of marking possession and ownership of that field system by a particular family. Um, I sort of think of it as a, a spiritual electric fence. Now, um, in 1990, no, let's get this right, 19, oh archaeologists can't do dates. <laughs> it was November 1982, we were out doing a survey, Fane Gate is in the background there, over there, and we were out in the depths of Flag Fen, and this was the day before we actually discovered, or two days before we actually discovered Flag Fen. My wife's there, um, Maisie's there, standing at um, Alderman Station at, at, at sea level, and then uh, David Gurney, who became county archaeologist in Norfolk, was one of our team, um, is standing at the top holding a range pole. So there we are, and then <coughs> this is Flag Fen that we found a couple of days later. This is after we've been digging it for a few years. Um, it is an enormous timber platform. Um, probably about the size of three or four football pitches. I think that's where you have to do it now. Or is that sort of, you know, one two hundred of Wales? <laughs> or, or the size of 15 London transport buses laid on their side. Or Nelson's column, I think, comes into it somewhere. But you could just say it's about five acres. Um, now, it consists of five rows of posts running across the screen like that and some, a lot of very well preserved timber, um, most of which at the higher levels is oak, and which in other words won't grow locally because it's far too wet for oak. Um, and some of the timbers are remarkably fine. You can see a post here with its sharp pencil-like tip. That's an unused post. And then you've got some big timbers here with mortise holes in them, um, and a nice wide, split oak plank. Bear in mind that in the Bronze Age, saws didn't exist. So all your woods work work you use done with axes and chisels, or the most important tool of all was a seasoned oak wedge. So you couldn't work oak in the Bronze and even into the Iron Age when it was heavily seasoned. It was just too hard for the, to, to retain any edge on your metal tools. You require a steel axe, really, to do good woodworking on seasoned oak. Seasoned oak. So in other words, most of the wood has to be worked within six months of felling, or something like that. Um, and while we were doing flag fen, we realized that this would be a golden opportunity to actually open an excavation to the public. And um, we had a building specially bought in from Sweden where one side was a metre longer than the other because one was on the edge of the dig and one was on the side that hadn't yet been done. And it's designed that building to stand up in hurricanes. <laughs> we never had to, but it had some fair old fen blows. Um, and then the archaeologists just got used to having parties of visitors coming through every 30 minutes or so, being shown around flag fen. And um, it was quite a pioneering effort of involving the public in archaeology. Some of our finds were remarkable. This here is the earliest wheel yet found in Britain, about 1300 BC. It's part of a, of a, of a tripartite wheel, so that's one part, there's a middle bit and another part like that which matches it. Uh, and they got a complete one out of Must Farm a couple of years ago. Um, and then we found metalwork in huge quantities. Um, and much of it had been deliberately 
broken or destroyed before being put in the ground. Um, some of these items are unique. Um, this little miniature sword here is virtually unheard of. Some of them are middle bronze age, so they're going to be around 1200, 1300 BC, like this rapier. But these big slashing swords, Wilburton swords, uh, are late bronze age, about sort of 1900 BC. Very interesting, though. Many of them, like this one here, are broken. That's broken there, across the hilt, and the tip's missing. If you look at that one under a scanning electron microscope, they've picked up the sword and then found a right angled edge in stone and gone bang, 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 and they've turned it over and done the same thing again. In other words, making it useless as, as a sword. So, what's going on? Why is that sword with its casting flaws at either end? Why is that being preserved? Why didn't they just put it back into the furnace, melt it down as we do? If you do a bum casting, you'd say, oh, something rude, stick it back in the furnace and have another go. Yeah. Because you were using a stone two piece mold, it's very easy to get bubbles in it. But no. And I would suggest that they took the same attitude that a lot of tribal people take to this day, or well, until very recently when they were still making metal work where the uh, furnace is actually shaped like a pregnant lady. And the metal comes out where the baby would come out, and no men are allowed, no women, sorry, are allowed anywhere near the process or near the men who are doing the work for a couple of days or something. It's always, it's heavily bound up in birthday rituals. So I would suggest that these swords actually were given names when the metal was poured from the furnace into the, the, the mould, like Excalibur. And then when the casting turned out to be faulty, they were given appropriate burial. And in other words, these other swords, these other weapons, probably remembered an individual person. In the case of swords, a man, or in the case of the jewellery over here, a woman, probably. Um, but what about that broken casting sword? Well, I mentioned Excalibur. One of the things that's fascinating about the Arthurian legends is that the sword, King Arthur's sword, is drawn from a stone, isn't it? If you make an iron sword, which is what King Arthur in the 6th century would have had, you beat it. It's made out of iron. You make it using blacksmith methods. You don't pour it, take it out of a stone mould. So I would suggest Excalibur is a folk memory of Bronze Age metalwork. And the, 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 the naming of the sword goes straight back to the late Bronze Age. Can't prove it but I can't think of another sane explanation. And we did have some remarkable finds in here. Um, these are particularly unusual. These are all made out of lead, pure lead. Um, and we had the lead analyzed, and it doesn't come from Cornwall. You know, I mean, if you want to go drive through, from Flagfen to Cornwall, last time I did it, it was about a seven and a half hour run. You know, that's with the M25. In the Bronze Age, when it would have taken you eight hours, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it would take you eight days. Uh, it would be far simpler to nip across the North Sea, up the Rhine, bing bang, you're in the Alps. You know, with boats and rivers all the way. Much simpler. And we know that, cross that seagoing vessels by then were capable of making the daily crossings of the Channel with no trouble. So we've got to stop thinking about Britain being cut off. And this is one of the things that's coming out of the new research around Stonehenge with the burials. There was far more contact with the continent, oh dear, than there, than there will be in about six weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't all been little Englanders. Now, we found so many remarkable items. We saw some good bronzes there. This was then, uh, I think probably still is, the only complete socketed axe haft from Britain, absolutely complete, and you can actually see here where the axe fitted on the end. 
Um, and we've got shell bracelets, all sorts of things, complete pots, because the site was wet and these items had been preserved very well. Um, it was a large scale excavation. You can see the size of the Bronze Age fields. This is an Iron Age village of 50 houses. But I want now to move away from the edge of the fence at Fengate, about a mile, um, into the deep fen. And we're now going to go near the town of Whittlesey. Um, I told you about my friend Martin on finding these places. Well, this is where Martin found them. We found them a little bit further right here at the top. Um, this is Must Farm, and this is one of the old courses of the River Nee, and it's been dug out. You can see in the background there, these are all the river deposits laid down from about uh, 1500 BC through to the Iron Age. And then lying on the bottom and the lower deposits are a series of remarkable um, finds. So, this is the only time, incidentally, to my knowledge, anywhere in Europe, that people have dug an intact prehistoric river. Um, and you've got various boats, we found, not we found, the Cambridge team found the eight boats. Uh, it's the biggest find of prehistoric boats ever made. And some of these extraordinary V-shaped fish weirs. So, you have a woven mortal work leading to a point, and at that point, which of course is pointing downstream, you had a fish trap. So let's have a look at some of these. There is one of the intact fish traps. Um, they're made in two parts, so the fish goes into the top part through a hole and into the next bit, and then they can't get out of that because the hole is pointing at them. And let's look at a better preserved one here. There it is, and there is a modern one which is still being made in the area with the two parts. Uh, it's a very efficient system for catching fish. Um, in fact, you can catch eels in industrial numbers. Well, not now, obviously, because eels have been hit by disease, but uh, you could have done in the past. So I think this is serious protein harvesting. You know, this isn't this isn't just catching a few a few a few bits and pieces of fish. For, for a Friday night, you know, this is serious protein harvesting, for the, particularly in the winter and spring when protein is in very short supply. And then they got boats, uh, eight of them complete, and then remain sort of, of the best part of the night. This is one of the best preserved, um, which has been decorated on the outside here, you can see with these grooves. Um, the, the, I'm pretty sure that is decoration, there can't be any functional reason for it. But a lot of the boats were very shallow, and almost certainly you would have been standing in them, like this one here. But look at the quality of the workmanship there. I mean, it's breathtaking. And that's it, one piece of, they're nearly all oak, they aren't all entirely oak, I think there's a maple there. Um, uh, just beautifully made, and again, I think we're looking at paddles or pumps for, for propelling them. Um, this one has another shallow vessel, but um, the slide's not very brilliant, but you can see there was a hole, and then that was blocked in prehistory, this is sort of 1200 BC, by this handled plug here. You pick that up and put it there, and you can see there's still traces of clay and moss surrounding that hole where they did the repair. And that's one of the things I love about wetland archaeology. You get these intact glimpses of the remote past. This is the shallowest of the boats. All the boats I've shown you, they've all been different ones. Um, this is very shallow indeed. And whoever was, was, was punting or conting, as we said in French, uh, that boat knew what the heck he or she was doing. Um, and then, uh, about sort of 50 metres away, a little bit further, uh, they made the biggest discovery of all of them, which was, um, I think it's six houses, Bronze Age houses, um, Bronze and very early Iron Age houses, um, which had caught fire, and they were on, 
There's some dispute about this. I mean, my wife and I still find it slightly hard to believe that they were raised up in the air in the way that the excavators think. And, you know, we go along with the excavators because they know what they're talking about. But I, I'm still not that entirely convinced about that. But um, basically, roundhouses, um, we'll go up this tower in a minute and look down on this roundhouse. And then it, the whole settlement is surrounded by a palisade, by a, a wooden fence, which is intact. Uh, here's the roundhouse, and you can see the roof timbers radiating out like this. You can see the walls. First time that Bronze Age roof's ever been found intact. Um, everything's there, including the rafters, the purlins, it's all there. All the joints intact. And the fines on the floor, when the building caught fire, and it caught fire very quickly, the man who's doing the study of the fire is a forensic um, police expert on fires. And he says that the forensic evidence for the fire at Must Farm is better than nearly all the houses and factories that he's investigated recently. It is that clear. He knows which way the wind was blowing, that it changed direction at one point. And the key thing now is, was the fire started in one place and did it spread? Or is there evidence for it being started in several places? Because if it was started in several places, then it looks like deliberate destruction. <coughs> if it's one, one place and it's spread, then it looks like an accident. So, you know, if we keep our fingers crossed. So let's have a look at what's in the house. We've had glimpses of pottery and things. Well, here you are, complete pots, moon weight. Everything that was lying on the floor of the house has just gone like that. And you can actually see on the inside face of this pot, it's got food on it. Um, there are wooden bowls, there are baskets, you name it, it's there. It, it is the most perfectly preserved house ever found in Britain, and I would suggest ever found in Europe, because the Swiss Lake villages have produced some amazing houses, but most of them were occupied for several generations. This building was occupied for a year. So you can be absolutely sure of what was going on in the various houses in the various rooms. It is a staggering opportunity. And if you go on Google and uh, do a search on Must Farm, they've got a very good website. There's obviously a lot of people here are very computer literate. Do follow them, because they, they update it regularly, and it's a fantastic read. And then around the outside, here you can see the, these are the outer timbers of the house we were looking at with the timbers. And then behind us here is this palisade, which eventually goes around and links in um, and cuts the earlier row of posts that Martin Redding found back in 1999. But these are the posts that formed the palisade, the outer wall of the settlement, and we've got them out, at least they got them out. <coughs> Here you are. Uh, I took one glance at them, I said, they're ash, and they said, yes, they are. <laughs> ash sharpened posts. I mean, if you didn't know that they were 1300 BC, you'd say they'd come out of the ground yesterday, wouldn't you? I mean, the preservation is staggering. I want to leave you with something. I estimate that if what we found at Must Farm is true, uh, is typical of the Fen rivers as a whole, and I don't see any reason to think that it isn't, then there are hundreds, possibly thousands, of Bronze Age boats still out there waiting to be found. And Must Farm wasn't a one-off, no doubt for an absolute set. There are dozens more, dozens. Um, it's just, we've got to somehow find them as a challenge for you, John, because they're deeply buried. And in Must Farm, the land surface of Must Farm is up there somewhere. And it's wet below there, so GRP has problems working. We've got big problems. But the main thing is, somehow, we've got to get across. The local politicians, and I'm going on about them again, I know, and others, 
that water levels must be kept up. We can't keep shutting water levels down. It's going to do irreparable damage. And uh, frankly, if you've got something like that, you've got to keep them. They're just too good. Thank you very much.